Good morning and good evening, everyone, and welcome to another EE Global webinar. My name is Clay Nessler. I'm currently the interim president of the Alliance to Save Energy based in Washington, DC. This is the first of our Accelerating the Recovery webinars, part of our EE Global webinar series, which focuses on how prioritizing energy efficiency can contribute to global economic recovery. The series highlights the experience of the Sustainable Energy for All Energy Efficiency Accelerators in scaling up collaborative public-private program models to improve energy efficiency in various industry sectors. This first webinar in the series focuses on energy efficiency in buildings. Our panelists will discuss opportunities for boosting recovery efforts by leaning in on global building energy retrofits and other efficiency measures yielding significant economic resilience and climate mitigation benefits. I'd now like to introduce our moderator, Jennifer Lakey, who is the Global Director of Energy Program at World Resources Institute. Jennifer leads a team of over 40 energy specialists around the world demonstrating approaches to deploying energy efficiency, renewable energy, and energy access solutions. Her work has focused on innovative energy procurement paths for corporate and city use of clean energy. Jennifer co-founded the Building Efficiency Accelerator, which is a public-private collaboration of over 35 partners, supporting at this point 55 cities and subnational jurisdictions around the world in implementing energy efficiency policies and projects which support the Sustainable Energy for All initiative. I'm delighted to turn it over to Jennifer Lakey and looking forward to this distinguished panel and the discussion. Jennifer, over to you. Thank you, Clay. Thank you to the Alliance to Save Energy and all of you for participating in this first of a very important series of discussions around how to build back better and in today's session, how building energy efficiency can be supportive of all of our goals for sustainable development and a low carbon future. Uh, I'm very eager to get straight to the discussions, but I wanted to frame a couple of thoughts just as we enter the discussion today. Uh, as we have experienced both the global health crisis and the economic crisis, we know that we are losing ground in many of the key battles that we have fought hard to overcome in the last uh, decade. We know that today we are seeing nearly uh, $10 trillion of uh, stimulus and investment go into the economy, often without pointing towards how we build resiliency, how we eliminate the vulnerability of our populations to future crises, crises that can be exacerbated by health, by poverty, and by climate change. So key to our recovery is going to be stepping back and thinking through where and how we take our our increasing investments and align them with our long-term goals. We're seeing today that about three years of investment in poverty alleviation efforts are actually being undone as people slip from the middle class and back into poverty and risk. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about how the links between the built environment uh, and what we're seeing in the opportunities associated with those investments to be to reverse course going forward. I wanted to specifically call out the importance of partnerships and the partnership models that we've been using through the Building Efficiency Accelerator and in many other institutions who are here joining us on the panel today, the United Nations Environment Program, the World Green Building Council, uh, organizations that work at the intersection of the public and private sector and organizations that, that interface with public policy. Econo Lair is one of those institutions and certainly we see the European Partnership for Energy and the Environment as another critical partner. Whether you're in a developed country or a developing country, country, the issues associated with building energy efficiency need to be brought to the fore. So with that brief introduction um, and with a quick comment on logistics, you will see um, that we're going to get started very shortly. If you have questions or would like to make uh, a, a specific directed question to an individual uh, presenter um, or to the group, please use the Q&A portion at the bottom of your screen. That Q&A will be monitored. We will continue to um, look at the questions and we are hoping to preserve enough time at the end to have a very lively discussion with all of you who've joined us. Uh, so please remember to use that Q&A function at the bottom. 
I'm going to now um, introduce Christina Gamboa, who is the uh, CEO of the World Green Building Council. Um, and I have to say, in all um, honesty, I am also delighted to say that I'm joining the World Green Building Council's Board of Directors. So thank you, Christina, and to the World Green Building Council uh, for your leadership and for building together um, a, an important part of the response to COVID. Uh, Christina has uh, the privilege and the honor to lead 70 Green Building Councils. Um, with over 36,000 members who are catalyzing the uptake of sustainable buildings for everyone, everywhere. The World GBC is a global network that delivers impact on three strategic areas, climate action, health and well-being, and resources and circularity. They work across sectors um, and they work in support of the Paris Agreement and the UN Global Sustainable Development Goals uh, and take a systems change approach. Uh, I've known Christina in ca this capacity as well as in her former capacity as the CEO of the Columbia Green Building Council. Um, she has been an active, committed, and a collab wonderful collaborator uh, in those different roles and has enabled sustainability and infrastructure to become mainstream in her home country of Colombia. Uh, she is an expert in economic research, in journalism, and in international affairs. She has an economics degree from the University of Los Andres and a master's degree of international relations and economics from SAIS Johns Hopkins University uh, here in Baltimore and Washington, DC. So Christina, please, over to you. Indeed, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the Alliance to Save Energy. Thank you, Jennifer, for that kind introduction. Hello to all the panelists. This session couldn't be more timely and, and, and your introduction, Jennifer, about how can we deliver a sense of urgency to society and governments to, to address issues to avoid, a, let's say, a next, let's say, crisis, if you like, and avoid emissions bounce back, but of course, delivering the green recovery jobs. And in the developing world, it is very worrisome what is going on in terms of how we're losing the progress uh, we've achieved in terms of equity. A poverty and also a, the lack of opportunity as we don't know when the vaccine will be at least a, available in those geographies. We have seen recently several reports uh, on the green recovery like the IEA. I just saw one yesterday from the World Resources Institute about prioritizing energy efficiency and how this is a way that guarantees we tackle those dual crises, if you like, uh, delivering that we avoid emissions bouncing back and delivering health safe and resilient and equitable places as we're confined, we're seeing that we do uh, have uh, improvements to make. And also as the stimulus packages conversations roll along, we know we can also develop a, a good conversation with the responsible investment movement so we can require accountability and reporting on energy performance and consumption. Uh, but why is that important? It's, it's basically we have a moment of choice we cannot afford to waste this crisis. So we can choose to, con to start to value how the built environment can deliver a way for us to achieve healthy, comfortable homes with fuel poverty eradicated, schools with clean air that educate on the relationship between, uh, 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 sorry, between um, the relationship between weather and the clean energy generation, and of course, circularity for a, a circular economy for materials. We simply must choose uh, to value energy and carbon also as something precious to us that we must not take for granted at the expense of our future, of our families and our home, planet Earth. So the need for transformation, equity, opportunity, jobs, new jobs has never been more front of mind. And from our perspective, we have been contributing with a program called Advancing Net Zero that has, has been advocating for performance-based solutions, which are critical to achieve that net zero built environment, which of course means a, the highest energy efficiency possible at the upfront, up but also contributing to the clean energy transition. Measures to reduce the consumption and energy and waste in buildings do offer the fastest and most cost-effective way to unlock carbon savings, and we see that across the reports, but they're being overlooked and deprioritized. Without them, we will need much more renewable energy infrastructure to reach the decarbonization goals. So to deliver Paris, to deliver the SDGs, we need to act on the built environment. So we can also deliver economic benefits, as I said, cost savings, green jobs, financial investments, and also avoid building and building new buildings, because if we resource and we manage to get the renovation wave going, we will be able to avoid dipping more into our carbon budget in the future. 
So we have 100 signatories in, in the net zero carbon building commitment, taking action, making leadership, but promisingly there's 28 cities and six states and regions that have signed that commitment. And so there is a political shift there or a, or a signal towards those, that net zero future, of course, high energy efficiency. So for, for us, for us, a, a, a sustainable development can and must sit at the core of the possible possibility of the recovery and its investment because energy efficiency is a proven approach and it must and we must find a way to incorporate in all decision making existing buildings we will touch upon today i will not let's say dwell on this introduction but we must do more and faster also delivering paris will not be achieved if we, if we don't address the existing stock and there's a program at world gpc called build upon tool that i can share more along when we continue the conversation and um yes again let's support both economic and climate goals in this recovery and because our future our only future is a sustainable future Thank you, Christina, and we'll come back to those themes that you mentioned in just a moment. Um, I'd like to now introduce uh, our second uh, panelist, and Pierre Langlois is the um, president of Econolaire, one of the most important and recognized Canadian consulting firms in the energy efficiency space. I've had the pleasure of working with Pierre and Econolaire on our Building Energy Efficiency Accelerator, and um, we're delighted to have you here. He brings more than 40 years of international experience uh, and 30 years in energy efficiency in Canada, as well as in the uh, global space. Uh, he has over 80 experts working across Canada and around the world on all aspects of energy efficiency and has worked both in the context of working with financial institutions, international financial institutions, IFIs, um, and bilateral organizations, as well as uh, working with businesses on uh, elements that can uh, help with the energy transition. He's focused on innovative approaches to eliminate market barriers, such as the use of performance contracting and adaptive finance mechanisms. He's worked with governments, utilities, and others, including ESCOs worldwide, and was instrumental in this design and launch of the super ESCO concept in many different countries. Um, he's part of the board of the Energy Efficiency Evaluation Organization, which does a lot of our measurement and verification in the energy efficiency space, uh, and for 15, for 15 years, and he has served as his chairman of the board in 2019 and 2020. Pierre, welcome, and a few comments uh, in opening from you, please. Yes, well, thank you, Jennifer. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, thank you for inviting me. Well, actually, I will not spend a lot of time uh, arguing about the fact that we need more energy efficiency and then we have a great opportunity in front of us uh, related to that COVID crisis and the important uh, focus of government to reinvest and reinject money within the economy. So we all know that major retrofit initiative can, can obviously generate a lot of benefits, uh, like Christina was mentioning. But I would like to focus a little bit on the fact that the old demons that we faced in the past, meaning that uh, energy efficiency seems obvious and it seems so good, but we still have challenges in front of us to make it happen. And those challenges will not be removed instantly just because government want to reinvest and hopefully they will reinvest in energy efficiency. The challenge to bring the money available and to, to bring the expertise that it's certainly out there to actual market transactions and actual project remains a challenge. And that's where the energy uh, efficiency co uh, community has to get together to be innovative. It's not enough to just grant, uh, offer grants to project. The government will not have enough money to do that to achieve our goals. It's not enough to just bring financing because by financing by itself will not generate the savings. You need expertise and you need capacity and you need equipment and technology. And just bringing the, the, the technology that is available today will probably make us achieve the goals of Paris. But on the other end, these technologies are not reaching the markets or in our own exper experience, when we work in any country in the world, whether it be Canada or anywhere else, we're facing those challenges that are more institutional, organizational, uh, human um, and legal than they are more uh, of the technical aspects. So what I, I, I want to share essentially is that we will need innovation and innovation in a way that is not only technical, because I think we have the technical capacity, but more in the sense of organizational and able, being able to uh, address the market barriers. One of the way is blended financing and using a lot of the different things that are out there in the market and making it happen all together. So when I talk about blended financing, I'm talking about the, the government not granting necessarily energy efficiency projects because they're financially viable, but more using their capacity to eliminate perceived risk in the market, to help financiers, to help the market, 
to essentially bring that money to the projects. But we also need mechanism. Performance contracting is a good example where you essentially eliminate the technical barriers and the risk perceived within the project. And a super ESCO concept, which I've been working quite a lot in Dubai, Morocco, India, now Canada, is actually one of these mechanisms that can be looked at to, to, to bring some innovation because not only they bring the technical solution, they bring the government involvement because they reassure the market, but they also bring the market forces that are out there. The ESCOs, the practitioners, the equipment manufacturers, the banks, everybody coming together in offering a solution that is hopefully easy to access, simple and financially viable for end users. So my, my feeling is the challenge uh, of, of tomorrow is not only convincing all these actors that we need more energy efficiency, but how to make it happen, how to reach the market and make it simple, and especially in a short-term period, as, as Christina and the others will mention, there's some kind of an urgency related to that, and we actually need to make it happen, so we need to be innovative. Wonderful. Thank you, Thank you Pierre. Uh, and we'll come back to the theme on finance and uh, ESCOs as we go through our discussion. Uh, but let me now turn to uh, our third panelist for the, our discussion today, um, Martina Otto. Uh, Martina leads the UN Environment's work on cities. Uh, she uh, coordinates across uh, multi-levels of government. She's the head of the cities unit, uh, but we know that she covers many important areas of work, including the Global Alliance for Buildings and Construction, uh, the food systems, and uh, looking at some of the 10-year framework uh, for action uh, and she's worked in the United Nations for many years as a breadth of experience in engagement strategies in developing sustainable development uh, programming uh, and since 1999 has been engaged in both the substantive and the managerial functions at UNEP. Um, she's an expert in sustainable energy and transportation, climate change, air quality and sustainable consumption and production. So Martina over to you for a few opening comments. Thanks very much, Jennifer. Uh, a pleasure to be with all of you uh, here today at this very timely uh, gathering. And uh, we've been very, very sadly reminded how important our homes are to our well-being at a time when half the world's population is living uh, under some form of movement restriction to prevent the spread of COVID-19. And many of us, those who can, are actually working uh, from, from home. And as we turn to well, well, many of us are still in the middle of it or getting into a second wave. Uh, we're looking to the post-COVID recovery. And there's little doubt that the construction sector with its 11 to 13 percent of uh, global GDP contribution and close to 10 percent of the global workforce will be included and covered by the stimulus packages in one way or the other. But the question is really how. And while our economies have come to a standstill, the climate problem, the climate crisis, hasn't. So we really have to make sure um, that we reduce this footprint uh, of the sector of some 40% of energy related greenhouse gas, gas emissions and that we renew um, the stock and go to deep uh, retrofitting. And in this context, I want to highlight basically three points. And the first is the one about vulnerabilities. And it has come up already a little bit. Um, but um, this, this COVID crisis has come on top of a housing crisis. And just as inequalities and access to adequate housing have increased vulnerability to protecting from infection, the housing crisis itself will um, be increased by the COVID-induced economic uh, crisis. Uh, so new construction and retrofits are at a record low already. Uh, and that's actually not what we need. Um, and investments in building and construction may decline by 20 to 30 percent, with obviously impacts on, on jobs in a sector that is marked by high levels of informality. So we really need to urgently uh, address those that are most vulnerable. That goes in terms of um, the housing conditions, as well as uh, the job uh, uh, securing uh, aspects. My second point is that COVID um, has highlighted the importance of nature for health. Um, for our health as well. So it's a one health approach. We have been eroding biodiversity and infringing on other species habitats, which has increased the spread of zoonotic diseases and buildings and construction have a huge material footprint and we need to urgently look into addressing this. But there's also a role for nature-based solutions in buildings, meaning bringing, bringing nature into the city. The sector um, can, uh, can look at addressing the next big thing, which is heat waves that are coming our way due to climate change. 
by having more well, recourse to more greenery on roofs, on facades, but also green space in cities to reduce uh, urban uh, heat island effects and harness a whole host of other uh, benefits at the same time. And my third point is on the importance of solidarity and cooperation. And we have seen that uh, a whole of government approach works really wonders uh, in, in making sure that the me measures that we're taking are going in the right direction. That, that goes just as much for the pandemic as it goes for a climate crisis. So the role of cities is absolutely critical. And we know that the jurisdictions are very different, who has authority over building codes, who needs to implement them, um, and so on. But there's a, there's a real role. And we've seen a lot of that already, leadership um, coming, coming to the fore uh, in this. Um, in terms of going forward, what we offer at the UN Environment Program, I just want to highlight one thing, which is a, a guidance document that we just brought out um, uh, on integrated approaches at the neighborhood level, where we have uh, made buildings a cornerstone of the transition trilogy, how we call it, so the connection between buildings, transport, and energy systems. I pause here. I'm happy to come back to that later. And the other thing that I wanted to highlight is the Global Alliance for Buildings and Construction Roadmaps. Uh, we've just released a global roadmap and one of a series of regional roadmaps. The first one to come out was the one for Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, and basically everybody who is, is on this call has been involved in this process in one way or the other. Uh, and uh, we involved 700 stakeholders, over 700 stakeholders globally. Uh, in coming forward with what we see is a, a framework and a process going forward. And uh, we hope that that can help as well determine this longer term vision um, for the building back better. Thank you. Thank you, Martina. Such important work and um, the roadmap release was a, was a wonderful addition. So congratulations uh, to everyone who worked on, on those roadmaps. Um, wonderful. So what we're going to do now is I'm, I'm going to frame a couple of questions uh, for the entirety of the group um, and we'll take a turn uh, providing a few responses to my questions. Um, but I see we already have a few questions coming in into the Q&A portion at the bottom of your screens. Just as a reminder, that's where we're going to be um, pulling our questions for our panelists. Um, so let me kick us off and then we'll turn to the questions on the screen. Uh, but I wanted to first catch that uh, we have Andrea Voigt, who has not given her opening, so I'm, I apologize um, for, for moving down my agenda too quickly because it is really important that we look at what's happening in Europe because it's one of the few bright spots that we have as, uh, as we've looked towards where the Build Back Better opportunities for our stimulus have come. Um, Andrea is the Director General of the European Partnerships for Energy, Energy and the Environment. Um, she has been a voice for the refrigeration, air conditioning, uh, and uh, heat pump industry in Europe. Um, she has worked uh, since 2019 in Brussels dedicated to creating a favorable environment and conditions uh, for the development and deployment of sustainable technologies across Europe. Um, she's also working with manufacturers from around the world, Europe, Asia, North America, and she has um, a strong industry background in energy efficiency, renewable energy, and climate related topics. Uh, e e PEE has become one of the leading uh, HVAC and uh, industry trade associations uh, across Europe and on a global level. Uh, they partner with UNEP and with a number of organizations like the Climate and Clean Energy Coalition. Uh, and she's very involved in the cooling uh, campaign, count on cooling campaign for sustainable cooling in our buildings. She's a member of ASHRAE, uh, of the German Engineers Society, uh, KDKV. Uh, and a board member for the EU Coalition for Energy Savings. Uh, she uh, lives in Germany and is in fluent, or in German national, and is fluent in English and French, um, and has public degrees in administration uh, and implied linguistic science and marketing. So um, my apologies for having jumped over you, Andrea, it makes your comments even more important because they ground <laughs> us in the European experience. <laughs> No worries at all. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Jennifer, for the introduction and for inviting Effie to, to speak at the panel. Um, a lot of what I was going to say has already been said, actually, and I'm just going to pick up a question that was asked actually by everybody. And it's a question that I would have asked as well, is how to make it happen. <laughs> so, so from an industry perspective, um, it's, it's also a very valid question because the technologies are basically there. The question is, how to deploy them, how to make it happen that they are really being, that they take up uh, the space they should take up in the market. 
So just to, to say a couple of words on how we see that from the heating and cooling industries perspective is uh, we see three key areas uh, which are important to address. The first one is uh, obviously increasing the energy efficiency and a lot has been said already uh, by others on the call so I don't need to elaborate much more on that one. The second one is to shift to renewable energies. And here, um, heating and cooling, uh, again, can make quite uh, a big contribution by providing um, technologies that help doing that, but also by facilitating that switch. And I'll say a couple of words about that uh, in a minute. And the third one is a system integration, where we can look um, at uh, waste heat recovery and use, for example, at uh, thermal storage, uh, thermal energy use, direct electrification of end use sectors like heating. Heating in Europe, for example, um, heating and cooling in Europe, for example, take up like 50% of the final energy consumption. And in heating specifically, 80% is still based on fossil fuel. So clearly there is a role for that sector to play. And the system integration angle is a very important one, whether it's, it's a centralized solutions or decentralized solutions. There are a lot of um, options uh, available. We think that uh, if we work on these uh, three big pillars, um, the energy efficiency, the renewables, and the system integration, we can not only tackle the energy aspect of things and the greenhouse gas emissions, but also the air quality. And we saw that during COVID-19, that uh, during the lockdown, the air quality improved quite dramatically. So clearly there is a link as well, which, which is not to be uh, neglected in the discussion. So as I was saying, the, the big question um, that industry has as well is how to make it happen, how to create uh, the right framework condition, conditions to deploy the solutions that are out there. And um, I wanted to say a couple of words about what we have in Europe. That doesn't mean that everything we have in Europe is wonderful. You were saying a bright spot. And yes, there are some bright spots, but it's not as if everything was wonderful over here neither. So. <laughs> So first of all, we have the clean energy package. So that's, that's a very comprehensive package and I could speak about it a whole day, so I won't go into detail, but just to say it tackles buildings, it tackles products and it tackles the energy supply in a very broad uh, way. So, so this is already out there. Here it's about implementing across the EU in all of the member states in a harmonized way, big challenge and about enforcing even a bigger challenge. And then uh, we have the, the European Green Deal, uh, which is very new and which aims for climate neutrality by 2050. And which also will have this climate law, which makes this really legally binding. So it's not just a commitment, it's really, it's, it's really a binding a target. And I wanted to um, just quote two initiatives under this European Green Deal, which I believe are very relevant for the discussion we are having and also from a heating and cooling perspective. The first one has already been published. It's called the Energy System Integration Strategy, which is a very, very interesting hook because it tries to move away. I can't remember who in the panel was saying that, but it tries to move away from those um, silos which we have had in the past where you would look at transport and you would look at industry and you would look at buildings and you would look at energy supply where we would try to move away from this linear approach and turn it into a more circular approach, bringing those sectors together and using the synergies between, uh, between those sectors. And that for us is, is really a very, very important narrative, which has not been there in Europe beforehand and which uh, provides a sort of basis. It's a basis to reduce the energy consumption. It's a basis to bring in the renewables and it's also a basis to phase out fossil fuels. So, so it's something which is there now. The challenge now is to really put flesh to the bone, to think, oh, well, so, <laughs> so we've got the narrative. I mean, it's great, but how, how are we going to turn this into, into reality? So that's one important initiative. And the second one I wanted to mention is the renovation wave, which is sort of part or linked to this energy um, system integration, which as the name is saying, looks at buildings, uh, which is of key importance, but which has not been published yet. So it's going to come out in September. And uh, the key objective here is to increase the renovation wave uh, in Europe's uh, existing building stock from 1% per year to at least 3% per year. And we are light years away from that. And again, uh, the big question is how to make it happen? Because as I was saying, the technologies are out there. So how, how to get it 
to get it there. I think it was Pierre who was saying we need innovation in an institutional, human um, and organizational sense. And I would immediately sign that. That's what we need. It's not about the technologies. It's really about the change around this, how to deploy those technologies. So, so these were really the, the key things I, I wanted to mention uh, regarding Europe. I definitely believe that COVID-19 has shown us how vulnerable our societies are and has also shown us that uh, we need some fundamental change on how we handle resources and energy is one of those resources and it's a very very important one and i'm very much convinced that industry has a very important role to play here and is also ready to to play that role and to take that responsibility the technologies are set, are there as i said now we just have to work with a governments, with policymakers, with all sorts of actors to see what what it takes to make it really happen. Wonderful. Great. I want to go back now to um, this theme of what does it take to, to make things happen. Uh, I actually think that is important and um, ask if you could reflect, uh, each of our panelists could reflect briefly on what you think is different uh, about this recovery um, and what it will take to make things happen in a 2020-2021 timeframe uh, to get us uh, on back on track for energy efficiency as a central component of uh, jobs, provision, equity, and vulnerability uh, considerations, uh, and a low carbon future. Uh, what, what do we need to do differently or what do we need to replicate from past experience? Um, so let's start with that question and just see if you can pull a few examples forward from, from your own organization's work uh, in, in that regard. Um, I'm going to start with Christina, if you could kick us off and then we'll actually just go through the speakers in order that we did our opening comments so that we can facilitate a quick uh, transition and get to more questions from the audience. Yes, interesting. Thank you for, yeah. So I think uh, what's what, 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 uh, the difference of this crisis with previous ones? I guess one point, and maybe the reference point is 2008, <laughs> the financial crisis, when there was no talk about green recovery, sustainable development, really, the, the movement of sustainability had no traction and the consciousness of the low carbon future was not uh, mature as it is today. So a key, that's, that's uh, <laughs> a shining star there in the horizon. For, for hope. And uh, also, I guess, the, another difference is this, this um, bringing a crisis so close to home, so close to us about our health, our families, our own security has made the world more open to, uh, to discussing what, what would be that, that phrase we're using, building back better, how, what would be a vision of a, of a, better, a better outcome from the crisis? Uh, how do we move forward? Uh, I guess, uh, for example, in that project that I uh, mentioned briefly, built upon uh, two, where we're addressing with 10 green building councils in Europe uh, barriers to for that renovation wave, we just put out a report where we say it's key to foster collaboration across all actors, not only to raise awareness on the benefits, but develop industry capacity. So it was what Pierre was saying, it's, it's upskilling or reskilling for a better jobs, a uh, better quality of jobs, and also to for them to implement the solutions and the access to finance and technical advice. So, so the opportunity of renovation is attractive and also to be showing very quickly what is the potential for, for let's say, the, the cost savings, I would say. And that's what we found in that project. It, it changes city to city, nation to nation, continent to continent. But for us, let's say that formula of collaboration and ensuring that different actors are at the table, it did unlock, let's say, better, a better outcome for uh, case studies that can be brought forward and people can get inspired on how that really looks on the ground. Right, Pierre? Yes. Well, Bill, a bit of on what Christ, uh, Christina just mentioned, conscientiousness. Obviously, uh, the fact that every country now um, within their recovery plan has to include something about climate change, which was not the case 10, 15 years ago if there. Unfortunately, it might be a little bit of a trend and a lip service, so you have to say it because it looks good, but it's way better than not saying it at all. So at least people are starting to include it in the, in the discussion and the community is a lot more involved. So that's definitely a major change. The other one is the evolution we've made on over blended financing. When I talk about the role of government, well, government in the past, you know, they just inject money, they just inject money, there's a lot of grants into it. 
we recognize that grants can go so far and we need to use private sector funds, but private sector funds have been reluctant to invest into these kind of projects because of the perceived risk. So I think we evolved quite a lot in the last 10, 15 years related to the blended financing mechanism, bringing government and private sector together to bring financial solution. And a third one is probably the recognition that this crisis is gonna be longer than others. There's gonna be a deep change within the economy. And that's probably gonna bring a lot of, uh, people are gonna be a lot more conservative as far as when they, where they invest. So probably a lot more focused on growth. And then what I found in my past experience and when something like that happened, when there's huge interest rate or when there's huge, uh, huge uncertainty, people look back at reducing cost. So instead of investing and growing, you look at how you can make more money, you can, make more, you can be more resilient based on what you have. And energy efficiency usually blossom quite a lot more in these kind of environment because it becomes more focused. You need to reduce costs, not only increase production, not only build more, but to be more efficient. And that's where I think when people recognize that this crisis is not gonna go away in one year and it's gonna have major impacts on the building stock, on the way we operate, even the way we live, then people will look at how we can be more efficient more than growing. So I think these few points will make the next few months and the next few years quite different than what we've seen in the other crisis. I agree uh, very much with what was uh, just said. Uh, it, is, uh, it is a real difference, uh, the fact that uh, it was brought home so closely to us that our health has been uh, affected uh, so much. It's a much faster and a much deeper uh, change as well. Uh, that we have seen uh, what it happened what happened to the economy now after in, in such a short time frame um, as well and the fact that uh, yes we do see uh, beginnings of a second wave so we'll be in it as in other cases of pandemics in the past uh, for for quite a while it will have deep deep changes um, to to the real estate sector for sure uh, the way we work um, um, how what that will mean for, for the buildings, how we will use them, um, and also how we organize ourselves um, at home. And I think what has changed as well is not only that, uh, well, there has been a whole movement of Fridays for Future and the real recognition of climate being a big topic, um, that we have seen how hard we're hit if, if we're hit unprepared. And I just want to highlight that we have not been listening to science before. Uh, we knew that the stenosis could come. Um, it was pretty clear. Um, we wouldn't have known in which, I mean, how exactly and when exactly. Um, and that is different with climate because for the 30 past years, um, scientists have told us about climate coming. So we're on a trail and it's hitting us. And we know much more when and how and we're still not sufficiently prepared. And I think that's the argument uh, that, that, is, that is coming to help with uh, some of the energy efficiency measures. Um, I fully agree with what Pierre said as well in terms of uh, the, the financing and the opportunities there uh, that we will look maybe a bit more um, towards energy efficiency as in savings um, as, as well, so that will help. Uh, we have experience from the financial crisis um, that uh, particularly the uh, green uh, retrofitting is providing uh, relatively more jobs uh, than other sectors. Uh, so it is uh, an opportunity to help shift the economy um, while helping uh, people immediately. So that's, um, that, that's a point to keep in, uh, in mind. And we have a few lessons learned as well. Uh, what has worked? Uh, so in terms of uh, standardization, uh, looking at what vehicles do we have that we can use already and, and build on them. Um, and then some, some key points that we've seen certain cities already taking up, uh, that is um, using uh, social housing as a key lever, because on the one side we have seen the vulnerability, but at the same time it's a more limited number of decision makers that can actually drive this agenda. So using that to, to turn around the market uh, from, from, from that side. Thank you. Right. Well, I think we've we've got. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna take a few of these questions that we have in the Q and A portion. If others have questions, please uh, jump in. I, I want to just uh, reflect on on three themes that we've heard and we hear in the questions, and that those are around uh, the politics of influence, or you know, who do we need uh, to be? Who are the actors we need to be pulling into our conversations to have this create a political moment? Um, and I, I thought, uh, Christina, you framed it very nicely in your moment of choice. 
um, uh, framing for us at the opening. This is a moment of choice, and there are going to be key actors who need to hear from us uh, about the importance of building energy efficiency. So I want to touch on that and the sort of the politics of, of, of building energy efficiency and um, sustainable buildings broadly. Um, but I'm also going to cluster in then this question associated with whether and how this is a, we have a, now a personal action agenda that is also coming to the fore. Martina, you mentioned it, housing. Um, we are all, many of us, in a situation where we're working from home, we're living at home, we're acutely aware of how our environment, our built environment, influences um, our, our, our health, our safety, um, and our sense of um, whether there are, are um, opportunities to improve the air quality, the ventilation, things like that. So I want to I want to talk about both the politics and influence and the personal and the action there. Um, so uh, I'm going to open this up and uh, have you all um, provide a few options, Andrea, because I wanted to hear uh, a little bit from uh, you. I would love to have you talk a little bit about both the first question and the second question as we move into the second round. Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> Um, yeah, on, on the first question, actually, I was just typing uh, to you um, <laughs> that I would like to say something on the first one. So, <laughs> so uh, what I was going to say, actually, is um, in terms of differences to the, to the first crisis is, I think, one of the key differences is that in the first crisis, the banks were really the bad guys. And um, I think in this crisis, the banks can actually play a very very constructive uh, role and and they and we can see with the different financing models um, that there is a real change going on and that they can actually support from a finance uh, perspective and that also brings me to um, to uh, business models which we see which have um, which have been developed um, over the past months I would say it's very recent uh, business models still uh, which are based on a trend that uh, you wouldn't really be very keen anymore to own a product, but to rather um, have access to the service that product uh, provides. So that can be, if you take a car, for example, you don't necessarily, if I look at my colleagues in the office or, or the younger colleagues, nobody has a car, uh, but they drive with cars because you have those uh, shared models in Brussels where, where you just have access to, to the car when you need it, and, and that's fine. And so you would have similar sorts of models for light, for example. And you now see also that those models come up for cooling and also for heating. It's still in its beginnings, but there is a lot of potential there. And, um, and uh, that potential, those, those models help, would also help if broader uh, deployed, would also help to overcome the investment barrier because the investment barrier for energy efficient uh, products from a, from a product perspective is still quite high. So people would just shy away from buying, for example, a heat pump because it costs three times more. I'm just saying something is costs much more than, uh, than a very basic heating device. So, so, so having such business models where you would look at the service provided rather than at the product provided uh, or bought um, could, could help very much in terms of deploying. The second point I wanted to mention what is really different is that we have the European Green Deal now, which is um, called the growth strategy for Europe by, by the Commission uh, President Ursula von der Leyen. And I think that's a very, it's a very bold statement and a very important statement. It's not like we're doing Green Deal because it's, because uh, simply we want to be good for the environment. Obviously that's uh, the main driver, but what she's also saying very clearly and what resonates quite well is that it's seen as, as really a growth a strategy um, which should leave, as she's saying, which should leave nobody behind, but which should really make sure that it's accessible for all uh, citizens and that everybody can benefit from that strategy. And that cert sets a certain direction, which has not been there in, in the past uh, when we had the first crisis. And then the third point which just came to my mind was uh, when we are talking about all, all this money which is being made available, um, if I'm talking about the EU for the green recovery or for recovery, uh, generally speaking, there is a very strong trend now to see that that money, that funding should be linked to um, criteria which are also related to the environment and to the climate and that it shouldn't just be given to anything and everything. 
uh, based on uh, economics. So also linked to the, the bigger principles and the bigger directions of, of the European Green Deal. And I think that is also a very important uh, point, which was not there uh, when we had the last crisis and which will help uh, drive change. And we see this also, it's not just coming from one part of Europe or from a couple of countries. We see calls really, which were signed by, by dozens of, of member states, you can say, all across Europe, whether it's in the north, in the south, in the east, in the west, um, there is no, no specific pattern. There are a lot of um, member states who really see this potential and see the necessity to linking the funding to the key criteria of the European Green Deal. And I think that's a very, very important point as well to, to drive uh, the change. So the, these were the three points I wanted to mention on your first question. Now I forgot your second question. So. The second question was around who, who can be influential? What's that politics of influence and, and who, who are the actors we need to engage? And, and in your experience in Europe, um, how does that need to come to right. the fore? And, and the, the question of the personal, is there also a personal call to action here that we as individuals and as, as a part of a broader civil society business need to bring bringing into this conversation as well? Well, I think if I take uh, Europe, uh, the challenge we have here in Europe, that it, a lot of it is uh, set at a European level. It's being decided um, by the European institutions, bearing in mind that there is no such thing as an isolated European institution. It's, also, it's always made up of the people from the member states, of the leaders from the member states. It's not as if there was sitting a bureaucracy in Brussels working on its own. Um, completely detached from, 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 from member states. That's, it's often portrayed like that, but it's not at all the case. Uh, you, you would have a clear representation of all of the member states um, in all of the decisions taken. But nevertheless, there is always this, um, this sort of tension between uh, what we have at, a, at an EU level and how this is then going to be implemented at a national level and even at a regional level. And I think that's one of the key challenges and one of the main things to tackle um, to, not, to, to make sure that all these policies, all these initiatives, these trends, which we see here, that those are being understood and, and also um, that there is ownership at national level for, for all those things so that it happens really on the ground and doesn't remain a, a theory, a nice theory. And that then goes even further. It goes from the national member state level, then also to the regional level and to the city's level, of course, where the mayors have a very important role to play. It's really bridging that gap between what is said up there and what is really happening on the ground. So, so that's, I think, very important in terms of actors, speaking to the actors uh, at national level and at regional level, making sure that this, this link is there and that we don't remain in, in theory. And then, of course, reaching out to the citizens. But that's a very, very big challenge. How, how to best reach out to the citizens is really... We have, as EPE, we have launched, launched this Count on Cooling campaign in the beginning of the year, um, which is really about showing um, the contributions that can be made by heating and cooling with case studies and, and very tangible, very concrete examples. So that's, I hope, interesting for decision makers, whether they are European or at European level or at national level. But right. probably it's not, it's not reaching the people on the ground. It was not designed to reach the people on the ground. Now you, would, you, you could say you need to add even another layer then to get uh, further down to, to the ground and to the, to the people. So that's, that's a big challenge, I think, and a challenge where probably we all should work together to overcome that gap and make sure it happens because it can't be done by one association or one player. It's something which really needs to be a collective effort, I think. Perfect. Well, Martina, I'll turn now to you to answer this question. And we only have a few more minutes before we're going to have to wrap up. So I want to, Martina, in, uh, in the roadmaps and in other um, activities, again, who are the who's key actor that you need to engage and, and how do we reach individuals? Very briefly, please. Yeah. Well, I started by saying, well, cities have a key role because, well, they're in the front line. Um, but it's not only cities. It's this vertical policy integration between city and national coherence of policies. And it is 
all the sectors, all the players along the value chain that need to work hand in hand. And that is something that we've been saying for a long time. The sector is fragmented. That has always been a critical and difficult point in the sector. And we have an opportunity right now because we've seen that solidarity is necessary in this, in this crisis situation. And that's maybe the moment that we can pull it off that this cooperation, radical cooperation comes to fruition. And that's what we've done in the roadmaps. We've engaged so many different um, players um, and, uh, and thereby making it stronger, allowing for co-creation of policies involving the private sector in this creation of the, of the frameworks. Um, so that's one. And reaching out to the, to the individuals and indeed, uh, it's, it's wonderful having support mechanisms, uh, but uh, we've seen that for the past well, 15, 20 years uh, in, in, in Germany, for example, KFW has had them and they haven't been used as much as they yeah. could have been. And we're going out with this, um, but it's not the case yet. So how can we make those measures? How can we bring it home that they're doing good for ourselves? And I think that's the key. Now this health argument will help us in going forward with this. And by showing more pilots, green roofs, for example, people are afraid of doing it because they're, they don't know enough about it, but actually they can save money with it, even in, in terms of refurbishing the roofs less frequently, not known. So it's those kinds of things. Hands and well, touch and feel so that people see it as well. Right. Well, I think that's a good example of how you can touch and feel efficiency and, and uh, building energy improvement. Uh, Pierre and then Christina. Yeah, very briefly on the policy side, you know, the work that we're doing on the field shows that it's not a lack of willingness at the government level necessarily that, that limits the, intro the, the introduction of energy efficiency. Is the real details, laws that prevent you, you know, you were talking about roofs and all that, there's laws that prevent you to actually feed the grid with, with solar panels. Um, so technically it's possible, the people would like to do it, it would be easy to do, but there's, there's a lot of legal things. Accounting has been one of the major things we've been facing when we work with the ESCO, uh, because the rules, the new rules of accounting limits the concept of using energy efficiency as an enough balance uh, sheet approach. So you're selling energy as a service is a lot more difficult than we think, even though it should not be because energy efficiency could be a source of energy like anyone else, but we're really at disadvantage. We have a lot of other regulations where uh, municipalities cannot enter into contracts for more than three years. Uh, they have to work with the lowest bidders. Um, financing uh, structure are limited because the guarantees that are needed that are not based on, our, on the asset we're creating. So there's a lot of things when we go at the ground level. So what I would love to see in a, in a country is not only a, a ministry of environment, but a ministry of action. Someone would actually bring this willingness on one side and look at all these little barriers. And I just finished by one example, which I love to, to always mention because it's so simple, street lighting. Well, street lighting is probably the easiest thing to do as far as technology. I don't want to minimize the technology impact of it, but it's simple. And God, for so many countries, we're not able to do it because there's so many regulations, so many rules, so many things are that are limiting the capacity to just change bulbs that it's incredible. We're wasting so much time. So if I had a wish at some point on the political side is you have a minister of action that would not just take a look at the policy side and the, and the money side, but look at what preventing these projects to be finally done. All these rules, all these regulations, and don't forget accounting. I would love to work with whoever are developing these accounting rules. Please make them easier for energy efficiency. They make, <laughs> they make our lives so <laughs> difficult. So um, a, a, lot, a lot of hope somewhere, but uh, we're getting there. It's improving. That's a good okay. thing. Okay, <laughs> good. Well, I'm glad to hear that, Christina. And then we're going to have a one word of advice in the form of a tweet to end us today in our conversation. Christina, on the political and on the personal. Okay. Yeah, the political, I agree. I would say, as we maybe, as we collaborate in the past, Jennifer, it's, it's about building energy performance in buildings and any solutions that can bring awareness on, on what's going on. Because it's, you also mentioned the personal level. So if we take the sense of, of, of sensibility that we should be doing, living a better life with less, which this crisis is teaching us also, and the value of being connected with nature, we should value, we should use the resources better. And of course, clean up the resources, bringing in 
the clean energy transition. So yes, the political would be energy performance and caring about it. And also, of course, there's incentives and there's the simplicity of bringing in regulations that drive that forward, it, hopefully. It's not easy because it's very, it's very diverse around the world, but maybe with a sense of purpose of um, <laughs> supporting the recovery and making it about creating opportunity in this in this moment where we can facilitate those uh, buildings delivering healthy spaces and resiliency is is our chance and yeah i guess the personal agenda i would add a key thing in it's it's about rights to access not only quality buildings but also digital infrastructure we are very privileged today here connected and be working from home and being connected. There's kids around the world that don't, because of energy poverty, don't have even uh, access to homeschooling. They don't have tablets. So as uh, we are sitting very fortunately in geographies where that's sorted, there's, there's, uh, there's a recent World Bank study showing how kids are falling behind, even if they're connected to the internet. So we need to support, uh, let's say, that sense of place, access to nature, access to utilities, including uh, the digital, uh, in a way that we can bring a more level playing field for really to unlocking the built environment, bringing, let's say, a better chance of us uh, prospering as a society worldwide. Well, that's a perfect segue to our close, which is the one word of advice you have for policymakers uh, from your institution in the form of a tweet. So a very short, 140 characters or less. Uh, and Andrea, we're going to start with you. Sorry, I didn't manage to unmute. <laughs> I didn't count uh, the characters. I hope I'll be more or less in line. But <laughs> so my tweet would be, um, there is no way to achieve the energy transition if we don't reduce energy demand by using energy and resources more efficiently. We need to focus on demand and supply side. They need to go hand in hand. Very nice and very succinct. Pierre. Yes, well, mine will be innovation and creativity at all levels will be needed if we really want energy efficiency benefits to achieve its full contribution in the post-COVID years. Excellent. Martina. Mine would be green strings attached. Greening buildings and construction must be part of recovery to reduce inequalities, great jobs, climate-proof investments, and bring nature back into cities. <laughs> I love the green strings attached. That's great. Christina. <laughs> so I would say the green recovery is our only recovery and our future is a sustainable future. Excellent. Uh, with that, Clay, we're going to turn back to you to help us conclude this first of the series. Thank you for the opportunity to have us all here. Well, thanks, Jennifer, and thanks to all the panelists, Christina, Pierre, Martina, Andrea. Um, what a great panel and discussion, really linking energy efficiency as a critical tool to address the economic recovery inequality, and getting us on a good path towards a more sustainable future. Um, I'd also like to thank our audience for joining this webinar and others in the EE Global webinar series. We've really appreciated the participation and um, large numbers of individuals from around the world that have tuned in to these EE Global webinars. We're gonna be taking a break from our webinar series in August. Um, since we know that many of you will be taking holiday over that uh, time period, uh, we will return in early September with a webinar on grid interactive efficient buildings. This is the uh, idea of, of there can't be a smart grid without smart buildings connected to them. And that um, integrated buildings can provide many services to the utility system to minimize the need for additional capacity, as well as um, um, provide sustainability benefits. So a very interesting and emerging technology area. We look forward to uh, hosting that webinar again in early September, which will be presented by Guidehouse, which is formerly Navigant Consulting. So with that, um, I'd like to thank you uh, 
to our panelists and moderator, I'd like to thank you for participating. And we hope you all have a very health, safe, and relaxing uh, August break. Look forward to seeing you soon. Bye-bye.